Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode one, where we will delve into history of the United States prior to the conflict. As a note of scheduling, I would like to mention that next week, episode two, the plan is I will have an overview of slavery and the legislation involved with that. So if you do not hear something chronologically where it should be, and you say to yourself, wow, this episode one and this guy is already doing it all wrong, well, I would just ask you to be patient. It's a method to the madness. Just as a disclaimer, this one may trigger some flashbacks to grade school history classes, and if those are painful memories for you, very brain-numbing memories, I sincerely apologize, but we're going to have some common ground here because now you're going to know exactly how I felt in every math class that I ever took, so we'll be level there. Like any good story, we need to dial back our imaginary time machine a great distance from our perceived starting point. In fact, we will need to take it all the way back to the beginning. And we should be aware that in 1776, a Declaration of Independence was created by delegates from what were, at that time, the 13 colonies under British rule. This starts the revolution, and active combat is essentially going to culminate in the American victory at Yorktown in 1781, And we we didn't do it by ourselves. We had a little help from our friends at the time, the French, and their fairly large navy. So uh, thank you to our French friends over there. By 1783, peace was declared, with the British officially recognizing the fledgling colonies as a new nation. In 1787, there was a convention intending to fix issues under the Articles of Confederation. Now, the Articles were the first constitution, uh, but ultimately they proved that the central government was a little too weak. Prominent founding fathers such as James Madison and you know, JMU, go Dukes, uh, alumni, JMU, and Alexander Hamilton saw this as an important opportunity to create an entirely new government. The result, of course, was the constitution. We know this convention now as the constitutional convention. And with the Constitution, this is where we get the whole checks and balances system, you know, between your executive, legislative, and judicial branches. You know, certainly, you probably learned about that in your, your history classes there. Power lying with the state versus the federal government is going to be a continual debate, however, and, you know, you'll see in our story how that continues to play out. And those of you who have seen the play Hamilton should understand that conflict. You know, we had the Federalist Hamilton on one side and the Democratic Republican Thomas Jefferson on the other, and that's one of the things that they bump heads on in the play. In 1789, we have our first president, George Washington. In 1790, the U.S. Supreme Court will meet for the first time in New York City, which was the first capital there. In 1791, we officially have our first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and they, they are ratified, and we know those as the Bill of Rights. In 1793, we have a key invention of the cotton gin, which was created by Eli Whitney. And this device is going to be important because it's, it uses two cylinders to catch seeds out of a cotton plant. Now, if you were to do so manually, you might be able to produce a pound of cotton lint just by you know, picking the seeds out by hand, which sounds sounds terrible, but with the cotton gin, you could produce 300 to 1,000 pounds daily. That's going to make cotton a very profitable business, especially in the climate-friendly southern states, which you know, definitely is very important to our story. In 1797, John Adams is elected as the second president of the United States, and this is following the term limit precedent that is set by George Washington. So thank you, GW, for that. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but certainly whenever I see John Adams, I do immediately think of William Daniels and the extremely catchy tune from the play and the movie 1776, Sit Down, John, 
uh, that automatically gets played in my head. And, you know, is that imperative to the story? Uh, absolutely not. But it does go a long way for you all to understand how, how my brain works. During the Adams administration, a diplomatic incident known as the XYZ affair would start a quasi-war with France. This is sort of a 1800s Cold War, so to speak. The conflict is going to pit America against the directory-led French. At this point, they've already had a revolution of their own, so no longer a monarchy. Most of the action is going to occur in the Caribbean at sea. 1800 will see the hostility end as First Consul Napoleon is going to need allies against literally the rest of Europe is fighting him. Now, the quasi-war is important because the United States would question their stance of neutrality and the role that they're going to play in the Western Hemisphere when confronted with European colonial powers. 1800 is going to see the capital move from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., where it is going to stand 221 years later. 1803 is probably going to see the most savvy land transaction in history occur with the Louisiana Purchase. And this is going to add a vast amount of land to the fledgling nation at only $18 per square mile. And of those miles, it's going to be 828,000 to be exact, doubling the size of the nation. President Thomas Jefferson was going to logically wish to find a direct water route across this new territory you know, for purposes of trade. And in 1804, the Corps of Discovery, led by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, sets out to accomplish this task. On November 7th, 1805, the party reaches the Pacific Ocean. The expedition strengthened the claim of the United States on the continent, as well as mapped out areas for potential settlement, especially in the states we know now as Washington and Oregon. In the 1830s, a large wheeled wagon route known as the Oregon Trail will come into being for the purpose of transporting immigrants to these new settlements across the nation. Hopefully, as we continue our journey, we can avoid getting a black and green screen saying that we died from dysentery, so hopefully that doesn't happen. In 1812, there was a war conveniently with the year in the title for our history test takers. The United States and Great Britain had a rocky relationship after the revolution. In the early 1800s, the British were locked in a struggle against Napoleon in Europe, and oddly enough, the crown was not keen on allowing trade with the French and the Americans, and they would demand a license be obtained by any neutral countries to trade with France. Impressment of American sailors into the British Navy and their outrageous interference with American trade and westward expansion led to war. You know, Even though Britain and America are not at war after the revolution, they're going to assist various native tribes in, in their war against the Americans and their expansion. And in fact, there were Canadians who were disguised as warriors at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794. During the War of 1812, there were setbacks, like another failed invasion of Canada. I already tried that once during the Revolution, didn't work very well. And we also had positive results like naval victories at Lake Erie and Lake Champlain. Unfortunately, the Capitol and White House were burned by raiding British in 1814, and in that same year, Fort McHenry in Baltimore withstood a 25-hour bombardment. This inspired Francis Scott Key to write The Star-Spangled Banner, which was set to the tune of an English drinking song. In December of 1814, the Treaty of Ghent was signed ending the war, but unaware that peace had been signed, the Battle of New Orleans is fought in January of 1815. This battle does win fame for future 7th President Andrew Jackson, who is commanding the American forces. The British sustain heavy casualties and are pretty soundly defeated. Overall, the war inspired self-confidence in the Americans and grew a desire for further westward expansion. In 1819, the Spanish will cede Florida to the United States, and actually, 
the aforementioned Andrew Jackson actually leads an invasion of the foreign territory without a formal declaration of war. And this was to combat a collection of tribes known as the Seminole, who were raiding southern Georgian settlements. Jackson was already a veteran fighting natives after the Creek War of 1813, and of course again in the War of 1812. Interestingly, Jackson would capture two British agents who had been providing aid to the Seminoles and had them executed. Certainly, it lives up to Andrew Jackson's fiery reputation. And this is the guy who's on the $20 bill, mind you. There would be two more wars with the Seminole after Jackson, the third and final occurring in 1855. As a result of those wars, many of the Seminoles were forcibly relocated to the Oklahoma Territory. Creeks, Cherokees, Chickasaws, and Choctaws had already been removed to the territory due to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. This involuntary relocation resulted in thousands of deaths due to exposure, disease, and starvation. We know this as the Trail of Tears today. Some of the tribes actually had assimilated well with Southern culture, and they even owned slaves, and some of them took their slaves with them to the Oklahoma Territory. That's going to play an important part in our future story, so stay tuned for that. Something that should trigger those history memories should be the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. And even though it bears the name of the fifth president, James Monroe, the primary author would be the sixth president, John Quincy Adams, who at that time served as Secretary of State. Essentially, this doctrine states that there will be no further European colonization in the New World. This was partly as a response, oddly enough, to Russia proclaiming sovereignty over present-day Alaska. But it is also definitely inspired by the European powers souring on revolutions post-Napoleonic War. Britain was actually in favor of the doctrine, if you can believe that, because they wanted to protect their commercial interests that were growing in America. For our transportation folks, we have in 1825 the opening of the Erie Canal for traffic, and in 1828 the construction of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad will begin. Canals and railroads would be an increasingly important part of commerce, especially in the North. And I would like to highlight this point because we see an ever-expanding shift between the industrialization of the North and the agricultural rich South. Immigration in the 1820s would bring some 143,000 immigrants to the country, who are mostly going to be from Ireland and Germany, and most of them will be settling in the North. The potato famine of 1845 would see even more Irish come over, but their assimilation into American culture will not be easy. A nativist political party called the Know Nothings, named due to the secrecy of their early meetings, would spur anti-immigrant sentiment toward especially the Roman Catholic Irish, whose loyalty was considered to lie solely with the Pope and not with the new nation. Irish need not apply was a common print in classifieds of New York. Despite the difficulties, Europeans overall would be drawn by the potential of better wages and cheap land in America. Due to the better prospects in terms of the former, many would of course gravitate toward the northern industrial cities. The disparity of technology and influx in population adds into the view of northern states that the South was backwards and immoral for their use of slaves, which they referred to as the peculiar institution, while the South viewed the North as greedy and immoral. This immorality could partially be explained by the Second Great Awakening. Now, what was the First Great Awakening, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you did ask, because in the 1730s and 1740s, several preachers in the colonies would advocate for a return to religion, a sort of awakening of the Christian faith. George Whitfield, one of the leaders of the movement, would preach a total of 350 times, including to Native Americans and slaves. 
And it's important to note that they were also seen as deserving salvation. Whitfield and others preached that all were born sinners. No salvation would mean that you got a ticket to hell, and all people could acquire salvation and a personal connection with God. This personal connection with the Creator was emphasized so that parishioners were no longer dependent on a minister. New denominations such as Methodists and Baptists grew out of the First Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening would follow much of the same themes, including transformation through discipline, order, and restraint. We can say that abolitionism would be partially inspired by this revival. Let's talk just a tad about the tariffs of 1828 and 1832. Due to an economic downturn in the 1820s, the Protective Tariff of 1828 was enacted into law during the presidency of John Quincy Adams. This tariff was designed to protect the growing industrial north by taxing imported manufactured goods. Obviously, this would not really benefit the southern states because they relied on these imports, and that caused the protective tariff to be known as the Tariff of Abominations, which, if I ever start a band, which probably not, I'm not very music savvy, that's a pretty cool band name, so I think I'll pick that one. The expectation would be that Andrew Jackson would reduce the tariff upon taking office in 1829. When this did not happen, and in fact, the tariff of 1832 did little to aid the situation, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina argued for nullification of the tariffs, and an ordinance of nullification was passed by the state. Secession at this point was at least on the table, but you know Andrew Jackson is going to have none of that, and he considered the ordinance an act of treason. Along with the strengthening of federal forts in the state, Congress also passed the Force Bill, which gave the president the power to use the federal army and navy to enforce acts of Congress. Because of this heavy-handed action, South Carolina did not receive any aid from other states, at least this time. Compromise was reached before there could be any violence, but the message was clear that the North and South were going to have further disagreement to protect industry or their so-called Southern way of life. I also have a slight feeling that we will see South Carolina being a problem again in the future, but no spoilers, stay tuned. In 1835, the Texans declared independence from Mexico, who had in turn only gained their independence from Spain in 1821. That pesky Napoleon rears his Corsican head once again, as the French occupation of Spain led to revolts all across Spanish territories in the New World, including Mexico. The Mexicans were not wanting to give up the large territory of Texas without a fight, though, and especially not to colonists that were coming from the United States, as well as the Tejanos, or native Texan Mexicans. Most of us have heard of the famous last stand of the Alamo in March of 1836, and maybe even of Sam Houston's great victory at San Jacinto in May. Mexico would not recognize the Republic of Texas, and meanwhile, relations with the United States would also deteriorate, as most of the volunteers that came into Texas to fight the Mexicans were from southern states. Yeah, that'd be pretty miffed, too. Statehood would also be denied for the new territory for a few years. Once Britain recognizes Texas as a republic, the tune of the Americans will change, and Texas will be annexed as the 20th state in the Union in 1845. In 1841, we have William Henry Harrison as the shortest-lived president in American history. Now, William Henry Harrison is an interesting figure that I would like to take a bit of time and a little bit of a tangent to talk about. He served in the Army and participated in the Battle of Fallen Timbers, which was the campaign to avenge the worst defeat at the hands of Native Americans and St. Clair's defeat at the Battle of the Wabash in 1791. As the first governor of the Indiana Territory, Harrison will win a key victory over the Shawnees under Tecumseh in 1811 at Tippecanoe. The battle was fought mostly at night, 
and included groups of warriors infiltrating the American camp expressly for the reason of finding and killing Harrison, whose death they believed would cause the enemy to crumble and victory achieved. Next time you're having a particularly bad day at work, I want you to think about William Henry Harrison, and just know that as bad as your day at work has been, at least there aren't groups of fierce warriors popping out of the darkness to kill you, most likely decapitate you, and then show your severed head to your co-workers. The victory at Tippecanoe would inspire the great campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. John Tyler being his vice president, who would succeed Harrison after his death. Harrison will serve in the War of 1812, and will defeat the British and allied natives at the Battle of the Thames in 1813. Tecumseh will fall in this engagement, which is considered one of the pivotal battles of the War of 1812. Now, Tecumseh has an interesting legacy. He was admired by friend and foe alike. Tecumseh wanted a united front in terms of the tribes, the native tribes of America, against the American expansion. He wanted them all to band together, and that was the only way that they would be able to defeat the Americans. It wouldn't be just one tribe against an entire nation. He's going to inspire many works of art and literature after his death, and I have a feeling we're going to hear his name again, but again, no spoilers. We'll get to that point. Now, there is a concept that I'm sure you've heard of in your history classes called Manifest Destiny. This is the belief that the United States should expand even further, and it was certainly on the mind of President James K. Polk. Having a neighbor that was already a little peeved with you and refusing to recognize a state in your union could be seen as an easy target. Troops commanded by General Zachary Taylor who would follow Polk into presidency in 1849, were moved into disputed territory between Mexico and the United States and instigate a war with Mexican forces in 1846. And that is called, conveniently, the Mexican-American War. A common theme was that the Americans displayed superior armaments than that of the Mexican army. In 1847, General Winfield Scott will retrace the steps of Cortez through Veracruz and capture Mexico City. Winfield Scott is another great figure, and I will highlight him in a future episode. As a note of interest, the Mexican-American War is important to mention because this is where many of the main figures of our story will cut their teeth, so to speak, but I do hope to highlight that as we go along. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, ending the war. Mexico would recognize Texas and sell California to the United States for a small sum of $13 million. California had been one of the primary objectives for President Polk prior to the war. For all of you 49er fans, this is also where the gold rush will begin. California was already a possession of the United States in all but a name, when gold was discovered on January 24th, 1848. The gold rush would be important to the economic growth and importance of California propelling the territory to future statehood. In 1853, the United States acquired more territory through the Gadsden Purchase. During this transaction, James Gadsden was sent to negotiate a new border with Mexico by President Franklin Pierce. The reason for this was that they were hoping to build a southern transcontinental railroad. America would purchase 30,000 new miles in what is today southern New Mexico and Arizona, but unfortunately a railroad would not be completed in this area until the 1880s. The first transcontinental railroad, for all you Hell on Wheels fans know, took a more northerly route. Now that we are in the 1850s, I think that this is a good place to stop. We ran roughshod from 1776 to 1850, but hopefully the ride was not too bumpy. Next week, we can tie the issue of slavery further into some of these events. It will be a bit of jumping around, but I think it will be good to have a basic timeline down before we get into specifics. Bear with me, it will all make sense soon. 
If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to Patreon as well as a Venmo if you think what you listen to is worth a few dollars. Support is generally appreciated for the show's upkeep. And once again, feedback is also appreciated. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you and have a great week.